Hello, this is a recording of a discussion of Chapter 9 of The Boy in the Striped Pyjamas. This chapter is titled, Bruno Remembers That He Used to Enjoy Exploration. Now this chapter is essentially about Bruno's um, discovery, if you like, of what's on the other side of the fence. Um, and it's really his first uh, major exploration outside of the house. Um, and it's surprising, really, that considering that earlier in the text he's explained how much he enjoys exploration, that it's taken this long. We're already into Chapter 9, and this is the first time he's undertaken this sort of endeavour. So we're going to go through and have a look at um, some of the sections of this text and, and highlight some of the main or, or the most important uh, quotations as we go through. And you'll notice it begins with nothing changed for quite a while at Outwith. And again, it's another indication that a, a reasonable amount of time has passed. And we've got the repetition again of um, Gretel being a hopeless case. And he still wishes, like, poor old Bruno still wishes that he could be back home in Berlin. And he's just watching the day-to-day -day events as people go in and out of the office. And again, another reference to his father's office being out of bounds at all times, with no exceptions, and again, that's italicised as if it's some sort of title or something. And then as he's sort of laying on his bed and wondering what he should go off and do one day, um, he, you'll notice there's this quote here, but then things change. Father decided that it was time for the children to return to their studies. And this is the impetus. This, this I suppose, is what makes him remember what's going on. Um, it, it makes him remember some of the things that he used to enjoy. And the the note here is that this is also an indication that the children are going to be here for a lengthy period of time. The period of time that was labelled as, as for the foreseeable future is now long enough that the children need to be educated. And the teacher's name is Herlitzt, which um, I suppose Bruno is becoming more adept at describing people, and the way he describes Herlitzt is quite interesting. He was a mystery to Bruno, although he was friendly enough from uh, most of the time, never raising his hand to him like his old teacher did in Berlin. Something made his, something in his eyes made Bruno feel there was an anger inside him, just waiting to get out. So, an interesting observation from Bruno's point of view. He's able to read people relatively well, as we've noticed before. And then, of course, they discuss what sorts of things that Bruno has done. And Bruno asks the questions, but aren't books important? And this is probably an indirect reference to the um, book burnings that were organised by the Nazis. And Bruno sees literature as being rather important. And as a Western audience, we're positioned to question Hitler and the Nazis' decision to censor what people could or should read by burning all unnecessary books. And we see any such attempts like that as being, you know, oppressive governments, and we see them as restricting the population's exposure to knowledge, and we interpret that as yet another means of control. So Bruno's seemingly innocent question is actually quite... Uh, a pertinent one. So there's, there's a bit of irony in asking that question. And this was the reaction. Books about things that matter in this world, of course, explained Herlitzt, but not storybooks, not books about things that never happened, which is a good indication that we're going to try and change history. We're going to try and only represent that part of history that we're happy with. And this is um, further developed in this part of the text here. I mean the history of who you are, where you come from, your family's heritage, your fatherland. And again, you'll notice that what is trying to, um, what Herlitz is trying to achieve here is sort of an indoctrination, if you like, of Bruno into justifying why they're treating the Jews as, uh, in, in the fashion that they are. And of course, Bruno's reaction to this is priceless. He frowned and considered it. He wasn't entirely sure 
that father had any land. He always interprets things on a very literal level. And her list goes further to say, get your head out of your storybooks and teach you more uh, about where you come from, about the great wrongs that have been done to you. So as if to say that there is some sort of justification behind what the Jews are doing to the Nazis at this point in history. And that's the reason why Herlitz has been brought on board. Not to give him a rounded education to make him a better individual, but as justification for the Nazis' actions. Anyway, a few days later he's sitting in his room and he's bored out of his brains and he comes to the realisation, I've never really done any exploration, exploring here. Perhaps it's time to start. And then before he could change his mind, Bruno jumped off his bed and rummaged in his wardrobe for an overcoat and an old pair of boots, the kind of clothes he thought a real explorer might wear, and prepared to leave the house. And this sets him off on his next adventure. And of course he goes through the different parts of his preparation and how he leaves the house. And he's, he's noticed that he sees different people in all these different places and he hasn't really been able to put all the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle together. And he, he sees all these different uniforms and, and he can't consider the difference. And he starts to ask the question as to why people in the uniforms, the Nazis, do not interact more um, with the people in the pyjamas. And he asked the question, what exactly was the difference, he wondered to himself. And who decided which people wore the striped pyjamas and which people wore the uniforms? And this is a seemingly innocent question, but a very important one. Um, because even Bruno, who is a young and naive mind, is able to understand that it's very difficult to judge one person more worthy than another. And how does one go about making this decision? And of course, that's effectively what the Nazis did. They told us that one person or one group of people, the Jews, were less worthy of you know, sustaining life than you know, other members of the population. So, you know, it's, it's a very difficult question to fathom how that, you know, one can justify this. And then, of course, he goes on here. The pyjama people all jump to attention whenever the soldiers approach and sometimes they fell to the ground, and sometimes didn't even get up, and had to be carried away instead. Now poor Bruno doesn't understand that the Jewish people here are probably being shot or killed in some other way, and he just thinks that it's um, something far more innocent than that. Um, so his mind is unable to fathom the possibility of people killing each other. It just wouldn't cross his mind. Uh, and then he talks about these parties that they have at the house, and he mentions that father and mother obviously enjoyed the company of the soldiers. Bruno could tell that. But they'd never once invited any of the striped pyjama people to dinner. So he's quite observant of his, of his surroundings, and he's very thoughtful about who is included and who isn't included, so which people are ostracised by the actions of others. And he doesn't understand how these two groups could be treated so differently. And this is probably an indication that, as a child, he's always told, always been told, rather, to treat people equally. And this circumstance here doesn't match his understanding of the world and what he's been taught since he is a young child. Anyway, so he decides that he's going to head off in the direction of the fence. And his first task is to reach the... Um, the seat, the bench, that has this plaque on it. And he's always wondered um, what was on this plaque, but never ventured this far. And when he gets there, it reads, Presented on the occasion of the opening of... And he's hesitated, out with camp. He continued stumbling over the name as usual. June 1940. So even in this instance, we're continuing with the mispronunciation of the title of Auschwitz. And it's the fact that it's cold when he goes to touch it, I think, signifies the, the fact that it's a place of death. It's a place of unhappiness. There is no joy here. And then, of course, he continues to explore, in spite of it being with no exceptions. And we 
I think we encourage him, we, we want him to explore, even though uh, we know that it has potentially um, catastrophic consequences for poor Bruno.